All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Bill Walton. I'm very excited to have you with us today. We've got a special guest that I wanted to share with you about. This is part of Bill Walton Sales Training Executive Briefings Series, and we've got a special today. And we've been thinking a lot about the private client advisor community, no matter where you sit, whether it be in wealth management or insurance or anyone selling into the high net worth community in our sales community, if you will. It's been a tough couple months, as, uh, as you can all attest to. And what I thought today could be is, number one, a celebration of our profession, make some connections, share with you some insights, but also a lot of empathy and, uh, and some ideas and hopefully some com camaraderie today around what we're all trying to accomplish. Um, I'm delighted to have a dear friend of mine and client and just a, a very successful entrepreneur and, and, and business person and, and uh, a dear friend, again, Brent Hirschbeagle. And the theme of today really is, is thinking about COVID-19 and the high net worth individual and some conversations we can have right now that can make these connections meaningful. Those of you who are using centers of influence or some type of ecosystem for referrals and trying to stay closer to your customers and hopefully do some prospecting, I thought some of the insights today could help us all uh, get closer to customer and mean more to clients and mean more to prospects. And I'm just delighted to have, uh, have Brent with us to really kind of give you the bird's eye view and hear a few th things from the horse's mouth around some conversations to have. Those of you who don't know my firm, we've been around for around 20 years now. We're working in insurance brokerage and wealth management. We're client acquisition specialists. We've been delighted to work with some of the logos that you've seen to the right. You know, you get, grow a few gray hairs and hang around for a, a while. You get a chance to write a few books and have a point of view. And we've been recognized for that. And so any, any of you who had a chance to join and responded to our work and, and, our, and our marketing and our propaganda, I'm just uh, in your debt for that. So we've been trying to give back to the community. So we're, we're pretty, pr pretty proud to be able to represent the wonderful community that, that you work in and operate in. So we've been glad for that. So I want to introduce you to Brent Hirschbeagle. Brent's our special guest today. He's president and founder of Hirschbeagle Consulting. It's an organization that truly is helping brand marketers and pharma launch new products and orient their commercialization efforts around their growth efforts. So why don't I just pause here and Brent, have you introduce yourself to the group and then we can get started with our session today. All right. Thanks, Bill. Happy to be here. Um, you know, as Bill mentioned, uh, I'm a small business owner and uh, for the last 13 years and working primarily in the pharmaceutical industry. So over the course of time, I guess I've, I've gradually become a high net worth individual <laughs> through the ownership of my business. It kind of crept up on me, but it's nice to be here. And, uh, and you know, I can give my perspective. I think when Bill talked about this topic, I can certainly give the perspective of, 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 a, of a small business owner kind of navigating through some of these issues being, a, you know, I guess really the potential, a potential type of client that, uh, that people might be soliciting. So at least I'll give you my perspective. I'm happy to answer any questions along the way. I think, I, you know, I represent an N of one. Everyone's going to have a unique experience. I'll just give you uh, my appreciate. To awesome, be here. Brent. I'm just delighted to have you. And, and I know our guests are as well. So what are we going to cover? We're, we're going to talk about small business owners, the, uh, the client journey, some of the conversations to have right around certainly the impact of COVID. We'll talk about cyber security and cyber threats, some conversations you may may want to be ready for around fees and just in general, the client psyche. So I'm hopefully that uh, the agenda can benefit us all today. And really, we just wanted to have a forum to start and be able to help you have some of these, uh, these conversations to help you. One of the other catalysts, I think, for me having this session for you all today is some data that came out of the conference board just a few months ago. And there's a lot of data on the slide, but here's what I'll share with you is that it's gonna be a while till we get back to normal, but it's not gonna be forever. This data came out just at the end of April and most business executives were saying, you know, to get back to revenue levels or pre-COVID levels, we're probably looking at sometime around April or May of next year. So what does that mean? We, we've got to be able to adapt. We've got to be agile. You know, we've got to have some business agility. And I thought Brent, again, would be the perfect guest to help you and have conversations around that. So that was really kind of one of the, the, the points of emphasis and, and rationale for today. Um, Can I speak to that one? Just for yeah, a please. Because I think this is, I can tell you for as a small business owner, if you just go back a slide, you know, when this all hit, I wasn't sure how to anticipate what my, you know, what revenue would be like for the organization. So I kind of braced for the worst and then lowered my expectations and then said, Hey, it'd be great if I could just make last year's revenue. Um, but you know, for my, from in my business, and again, this is where it gets business to business, we're actually growing, you know, so 
uh, we're growing and we're hiring. So I think my, my kind of two cents here is that this is very individualized, you know, at the average level, sure. Some businesses are expecting growth, maybe next year return. Some are already booming and you've seen that depending on just what business. Sure. You're in, so. No. And I think, um, you know, in and around that, I think that's really kind of shaping the conversations and the trends we wanted to have today around, around the shocks or not the spurts of growth to small business. And what now high net worth individuals, present company are included uh, when, you know, you really can't get to the yacht or can't get, can't get to the condo in the Alps, right? What are we doing, right? We've got more time to contemplate where we're all kind of in one place. Some just quick data I'm going to share with you today. We'll talk a little bit about moving from cyber, cyber risk to cyber attack. Some of the data that's out there, I've read some white papers from CrowdStrike recently, and it's very compelling. So these are conversations, again, to have with your COIs and, and your prospects. But there's also a return to sustainability, right? More, more asset flows into sustainable investments, sustainable mutual funds in particular. Uh, but more since uh, with number two, right? From jet setting to couch sitting, a little more time to contemplate all of our relationships, certainly in business, those who support us, those who serve us. And also now, since we've been on so many of our digital devices over the past few years, we're looking for more in terms of how we engage our wealth, how we engage our, our, our habitat, and certainly how we engage how we want to do our life. So this is all kind of coming together and coming full circle. But one of the things that Brett and I talked about, and Brett, I'd love to have you speak to this in a second too, is, is the recovery that's already started. You've heard a lot of terms called V-shape or rebound or we're coming back. And we are coming back, but we're coming back in a different way, right? So if you had to think about you know, white collar positions or, or e-commerce, certainly, the Amazons of this world, consulting firms uh, like Brent's that are working in pharma that are continuing to develop therapies and, and remedies and solutions, right? This is, this is really powerful and helpful, but for um, uh, food and beverage owners, servers, you know, retail, some of those businesses are, are really seeing, you know, a fall in foot traffic certainly. And uh, it's not always kind of a bright story. So maybe Brent, you can kind of talk to our audience a little bit about how you kind of look at the K, if you will, and, and what that might mean for businesses in our recovery. Yeah, it's a good, you know, this is something I've seen in the press a lot lately, and you may have too. I think a lot of the major financial papers have started to talk about this, because this is like a new economic kind of phenomenon, right? There's, I don't think we have a history of anything that looks like a K-shaped recovery. So this is like, we're making this up as we go. But we see, you know, you look at, like they'll say the e-commerce companies, the billionaires have added billions to their net worth over the last few months. I mean, billions. Uh, the Hamptons still are partying. And, uh, and as is the West Coast, I mean, they're just doing it a little more quietly. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, the brunt of this lower K is really being pushed on the, obviously the service worker and I think the small business owner, right? In this case, this kind of shape, the small business owner didn't have the lobbying efforts of of the Lowe's and the Home Depot's and the airlines who were allowed to open and deemed essential. And, you know, so you're really looking at a whole raft of the population that, that might be on this downward slope and some may never recover and hopefully some, a lot will, but it's just, it's really just going to be divergent. And I think it, it'll be important, obviously, from your perspective to, to try to figure out which leg of the K your clients are on, because if you're on the upward bound, great. If you're on the lower bound, you just need some different advice on how to, how to recover and, and kind of move up. Uh, instead of down. So I think it's just a really interesting phenomenon that's going to have some pretty profound effects uh, on the economy. Obviously, we're going to see, you know, this could change tax policies and everything else as sure. there could be a continuous redistribution from the top of this K down to the bottom of this K if things keep going this way. So, Yeah. And again, thank you so much, Brent. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to share with this, you is if, with you, this, this whole session today is really about helping you have these conversations with your prospects and clients and, and bring some knowledge or they might be reading the same things we're reading just to be able to have a kind of a to and fro conversation and bring some ahas to it. There's a lot being, if you just Google K-shaped recovery, there's a lot of different opinions and pundits talking about it. So again, another platform for the right conversations with, with your clients. Um, and I think the, the theme here is that, you know, one of the things that those of you who have had a chance to work with my organization, you know, I'm really big on, on client type segmentation. I think it's, it's easy for us just to say, hey, you know, the average age of a high net worth individual is pushing 60. We know we have an aged population, source of wealth, you know, many, if not most, present company included with Brent, right? Folks are working, they're working in their business or doing something gainfully with, with their day. And that's really where the, where the source of wealth is coming from. 80, almost over 80% are, are self-made and 
So that tells me that, hey, the hands are still on the handlebars. I don't know how tight they're being gripped, but you can tell that it's been a crazy ride for the last five to six months. And that, you know, I think some of the themes we'll talk about today are not just, hey, how do we asset allocate for where we are right now in terms of more bonds, more cash, more equities? It's bigger than that, deeper than that. So I just wanted to kind of create that platform. But one of the things, this is kind of taps into our little bit of our secret sauce, and this is not a marketing message, message at all, but I just wanted to share this importance around shaping these conversations. And um, some of you, again, have been through this. You really need to think about through the lens of these five conversations, the source of the individual's wealth, right? There's, when you, when you say high net worth individual, it really differs across the spectrum of whether they, their wealth is created or whether it's inherited. Whether that's a serial entrepreneur or someone who's had a business for 30 years thinking, gosh, you know, just six months ago, I was ready, ready to sell it or turn it over to the kids. You know, those, those ideas have changed and now you've got, you know, senior C-suite executives now that don't want to panic and certainly they're restricted in terms of what they can do financially. They don't want to trigger market events. So you got to be thinking, you know, empathetically about this group. But then the folks that, uh, you know, are, are in family offices or, hey, you, you, are, you own the southwest corner of Montana, right? You're a large asset owner. You're wondering, you've got different thoughts around this K-shaped recovery too. Certainly if you're a philanthropic organization, you're worrying about inflows, you're worrying about the sustainment of your organization. A lot of these events that you just can't do, right? The golf outings and the dinners and the galas that are so powerful and so wonderful, you're not able to do that. So, uh, you know, everyone's trying to be more creative. So again, having these conversations really kind of depends on where you're high net worth individual, the entity or the individual kind of sits on that, on that platform. So let's get into the meat of this, right? Conversation one or trend number one, um, COVID-19 and the small business owner. I, I think for me is um, this is about asking your, your client or your prospect how they're doing, right? You can think about some examples, right? Abrupt cancellation of orders or in Brent's case, right? I've got to hire more people. We're doing rather well. The stream of work and, and, the, and the flow and the pace of the work has increased. Uh, many of our clients have a workforce that are unwilling to engage. They've embraced working remotely and maybe there's just a, still some apprehension. Brent, you know, you'll have to speak to this in a second. Um, yeah. Many are still working against their existing banking relationships and maybe thinking beyond that. So these are some of the questions to have around the small business owner. Why don't I just kind of pause here and let you hear from one, <laughs> Brent, as we kind of <laughs> teed this up the other day and talked about trend number one. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting because in, in in my business, I, I was bracing for an abrupt cancellation order, so they didn't happen. But I, obviously, I see a lot of businesses where they did or their supply chains were disrupted. And so they may be getting orders, but they can't, they can't actually manufacture or supply. So there's a lot of interesting things that go on that maybe that will lead to pent-up demand that can then be fulfilled in the fourth quarter. And, and they could kind of make that money up. They all have to determine whether that revenue is lost or delayed. Um, I can certainly speak to the frightened workforce. I mean, in our case, you know, my, my folks could kind of go completely remote, but because they can, they're also, uh, they also seem very unlikely or less likely to want to come back. And so, uh, you know, you're kind of dealing with, uh, I think in the interim that, you know, businesses can produce, but, but we all worry, the number one worry about small business owners is maintaining culture, right? How do I maintain the culture of the firm? How do I attract new employees? How do I keep up with the demand that I have? because my whole means of my regular way of doing business is now disrupted and, and there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, and you think of strained banking relationships or different banking relationships. That's certainly something that we immediately went to our banks and kind of trying to figure out where we stood. Um, we were, we we're just about to start spending a lot of money building a larger office uh, that we needed, but we don't really need it anymore. So like a lot of it is, all right, well, the banks lend me the money to complete that construction project. Uh, will my line of credit be okay? Will all these things be okay? Like these were very, real and tangible concerns as a small business owner, you know, applying for the PVP, all those things were, were a big deal. And they really took away a lot of energy from just doing your normal work and thinking about growing your business. You're just worried about defending your business. So, um, you know, and then we're looking at just making sure that we can, uh, you know, pivot, like you said, and, and adjust any new business models uh, as we go along and kind of just get back to focusing on beating our competition. And, uh, and, and growing the firm instead of just worrying about its very existence. So I think th those are all the things that are on the mind of your, of your clients, potentially, if they're doing well or if they're not doing well, they're, they're, they're distracted by a lot of these things. And I think, you know, to be able to have a, a real conversation, an empathetic conversation about it, and to be able to provide help in any of those ways, they're all distractions to the owner's original purpose. And uh, they, they'd love advice and help and empathy to get through it. 
Yeah, so that's great. And, and I don't know if the if the the gang online has had a chance to see a, a video that I, I threw out there in social media the other day. A couple, the quick questions that you can ask around this. I, I call them journey questions, right? We can ask our COIs and ask our prospects and clients, hey, you know, since March, what's been your journey, right, through this? Where are you now? And then certainly where you're going. What, what what's your lens? I, I don't want to necessarily have, hey, tell me exactly where you're going, but I kind of want to know what's your time frame, what's your outlook? Is it, oh my gosh, I, I can't wait to get the next month, or is it really about thinking about first quarter next year? So you know, Brent, thanks for that tee up. I think that that's really powerful. And let's let's go to trend number two or conversation number two. And Brent, you and I just kind of talked about this the other day, right? Globe trotting now hazardous to some of the things that I'm reading in the in the ethosphere. <laughs> um, and, and I think uh, present company included, we're hunkering down in body and spirit. I'm just so lucky. I've got a wonderful family and been working out of the home for a number of years. So we're, we're tight, knit, tight knit group here. Um, but you know, in terms of the, the jet setting, wealthy, high net worth individuals, right, in terms of how they're used to doing life and where they do it, whether it's on a plane or a train or a, a flotation device of, of some largesse, <laughs> That, that has changed. And so we're thinking, we're more contemplative, we're, 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 we're stable, we're, we're in stasis. And when many of us aren't used, used to that. So maybe Brent, if you had maybe 20 or 30 seconds to kind of talk about this kind of from global to local concept and conversation. Yeah, I think it's true. I mean, there's the, obviously the business aspect of it of, you know, a lot of folks travel for business. I certainly did a lot. So it makes it harder to engage with clients. I think if you just think of it from a, like an energy management or mindfulness perspective, like, you know, a lot of business owners, from my perspective, or executives, they gain a lot of energy from being in front of clients. That's like a recharging, you know, making the sale, being with clients. So like, when that's not there, that's hard. That, I found that personally hard. It's like, where's my source of energy coming from now? Um, because I used to get excited by closing deals and being in front of people. Um, you know, and then, and for a lot of folks that, that work hard, uh, that, you know, that have a lot of stress in their lives, these outlets, whether it's a the one week vacation or a ability to travel to see family somewhere else. These are their, their energy outlets and, and kind of other ways to recharge. And so, uh, you know, it's just, it gets tough on the individual, I think, to find ways to, to turn inward a bit to, for other kinds of stress or anxiety redu reduction, whether that's mindfulness, uh, yoga, some exercise, you know, things like that, that would help people stay mentally balanced. So I think it's also a reasonable conversation, a, a, a caring conversation to have within your clients about yeah. how they're doing mentally, you know, and, and emotionally. And, you know, you don't always break into all of that, but, but I found actually now that you can actually have, I think, deeper, more authentic conversations with people because we're all going through this together. And I actually know more about my clients now personally than I ever did because they're willing to share. And that I think can create a depth, an opportunity for depth in your relationships with people that are authentic. Yeah, and I would say, you know, the private client advisors on with us today and the folks that I know, I mean, you're, we're authentic, genuine people, right? That's where we're in this business. So I, I think, uh, I think uh, that that door is, uh, is cracked and warm and, 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 and more able for us to kind of walk through that. Let's talk about trend number three. And, and Brent, you and I talked about this the other day, and this is some of my data. Many of our clients uh, are, are in, the, in the cyber risk business or trying to take care of their clients and help them be more mindful. Uh, the data is very powerful. Uh, Accenture and, and Aon both have published some wonderful data, and hopefully uh, I'm, I'm quoting them all, both those sources properly. But there's five point trillion at risk from cyber attacks over the next five years. And, and, and to me, a trillion is still a lot of money, <laughs> particularly if it's multiple <laughs> trillions. Um, and high net worth individuals are targets. And, um, you know, we talked about the various forms of wealth, right? Inherited wealth, if, if the individual is working through a family, a family office entity, 40% of family offices don't have a dedicated system in place or, or a, uh, um, uh, a remedy in place. And that's, and that's dangerous for lack of a better term. And I think most of the high net worth individuals, 77% from the Aon data is that they're worried about being hacked and their investments declining in value. That, that's something that that's of concern. Um, so, and, and there's a greater opportunity now for vulnerability assessments. If your firm is doing those, I think that value add is really powerful right now. And, I know, Brent, you were surprised by some of this data. Maybe you can kind of share with the gang a little bit about how you look at cyber risk. I know you guys were early adopters around cybersecurity, but, you know, I'd love to have some wisdom around that if you had it for us. Yeah, I think in our industry, we got, you know, we got pushed to looking at cyber risk because our clients were targets for cyber risk, right, and, and getting hacked. And so we have to have that same kind of level of protection that our clients do uh, because we possess some of their data. They're, you know, very important data. So I was surprised, I guess, when I got into it, how, relatively inexpensive the uh, 
the insurance was for this, you know, to put policies in place and procedures in place and get the insurance. It, it certainly allowed me to sleep better at night knowing that I had uh, approached some of this a little more thoughtfully. Because again, you're usually just, you're just worried about doing your, delivering your core service or product to your clients. You don't, this is like an extra thing, an operational aspect you don't really want to worry about, but, but risk mitigation and risk management uh, is important. And the thing that I thought about is, is really the portability of your, of your cy cybersecurity. You know, you talk about th the last trend, right? We're spending more time at home or out of the quote unquote office. Is that, is that traveling with you? So again, again, these are conversations we want to share with you that, uh, that are ripe for having and the door is open. And I think hopefully with, with the help of our conversation today, you can bring some of these nuggets and some of these data points to, to have a more robust conversation, to help you get a little closer to the campfire with your prospects and your clients. Trend number four is one of the things I've been reading about, more money, more flows back into social investment funds and impacting investment, where lifestyle meets work style meets risk. I think that's kind of where we are. And from the latest data point from Capgemini, 40% of the ultra high net worth segment is willing to put cash into sustainability. Uh, and uh, not to say that they're dedicating entire portfolios to that, but they're planning to allocate upwards of 40% by the end of this year. And, and that, that's a lot. If you had to think about anyone who's mindful of portfolio construction or asset allocation, that's a lot of, that's a big percentage. That's a lot of money. Um, returns are coming back, right? There's less lo lower perceived risk now with some of these uh, uh, socially related uh, and connected investments. And I think now with part of trend two, right? Spending more time, we're being more mindful or kind of reconnecting to purpose and, 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 and things of that nature, right? There's, there's, we're looking for avenues to help others. Certainly if our philanthropic efforts are being shut down, there's other ways that we can kind of support and, and, and be willing to give back. Yeah. And, um, you know, the financial advisor is not the sole source of insight, right? There's other you know, sources of insight out there. I think we can be that, you can be that. So there's an opportunity to have that conversation. Maybe Brent, you can speak to, you know, your thinking around sustainability or any of the, the thinking of your employees around social impact. Yeah. I mean, I guess what I'm thinking from like an investor's perspective, um, and again, this is not my area of, of, of deep expertise, but I think a lot of the sustainable, um, let's say investment strategies, I think a lot of them have been tied to uh, tax relief strategies as well, you know, and I, I would be cognizant and maybe advising clients of what the changing policies may be, you know, relative to any kind of um, administration change in the future and, and budgetary pressures, right? Can, you know, will will some of these sustainable portfolios be as uh, attractive or lucrative if there's massive changes to the tax code or shortfalls that have to be made somewhere? That that's just one aspect of it. You know, that's you think about the early days of uh, Tesla was all based on you know credits, uh, purchasing credits right. Right. paid for by the government, right? So if those go away, your whole investment strategy may may look good one day, but not so much the next. Right. So I have a tax conversation around that. Again, just another conversation to have, another, another, another thing to, uh, to tap into. And I, I, would, I would go to the Capgemini research. It was pretty powerful. I just, I, of course, I grabbed the headlines and the, and the bullet points and, and the numerics, but um, there, there's a lot to be said. They did a really nice job with that study, and it's very current. Let's talk about number four, fees and the client journey. Again, I just put a video out there talking about fees. And here's my thought around fees and cost and, and the manner in which you, you work with, with organizations. So I guess the first thing as a coach would be to say, never be surprised by a fee conversation because it can happen at any point in time. But I kind of operate as uh, Andy Grove did when he founded Intel, right? Kind of a controlled uh, paranoia around what we are, what we aren't doing, what value are we creating? So that, that's a great way to kind of think about it. But the other way I think about fees and being ready to have that value conversation is having some, a better cadence, a more routine cadence of how you're engaging with your clients whether it be annually where you're reviewing a stack of statements and, hey, we'll see you next year, or something more, um, uh, more recent, whether it be monthly, quarterly, uh, semi-annually, so that there's this rolling snowball of value. And, hey, I, every time I connect with you, I just want to let you know what I've done on your behalf. And, you know, the data from last year is very powerful. 33% are uncomfortable uh, and critical of fees. And, and that's, that's not a good number. That's a very high number. And on the wealth management side, uh, not, uh, I haven't read too much on the private client, uh, private insurance side, but one in five are considering a switch. Now, I don't know what the ratio is in times of, of uh, in, in normal times, if you had to say we are not normal right now, but that's a high number too. And there's a vulnerability, certainly for me as a salesperson or certainly as an advisor, that, that, would be, uh, that would be something to think about. So that, that's my fees conversation. The other point be, before I hand it off to Brent is that 
we've all been delighted by some of our digital customer experiences, whether it be through Amazon or some other websites where we purchased um, beauty boxes or any type of, gosh, if you think about a wardrobe today, you can literally buy a wardrobe in a box and really cool things come to you and they're assembled and that's really a nice kind of service. And AI is fueling a lot of that. And I think when it, when it comes to our investments, I, I think that kind of stops short. We want a little bit of that joy. We want a little bit of that journey. We want that a little bit of coolness and an app and a, and, and a flow in terms of what we're used to. Um, and I think that's getting better. But the, the big tech and the fintech disruptors, they're, they're, they're not only coming down the street, they're on the porch. And they are ready and they're, they're taking assets and they're improving that kind of interaction. You know, again, with all of us kind of being sequestered since, uh, you know, mid to late March, right, we're on our mobile devices. It's rare that we're just on a, on, on a laptop or, or a desktop back in our office. So let me kind of pause here and grab some oxygen and let Brent some, add some wisdom into Brent <laughs> 5, which is conversation five. I think, you know, when it comes to fees, I think I know personally what I, what I value is transparency and I value a relationship and some communication. You know, I think if you're going to be, and, and people will always pay for value, you know, it's same. I sell professional service to my clients. Right. And, and I'm, I always compete against, I compete against technology in my business. I compete against being commoditized uh, in different aspects of my business, just like financial services do. And, you know, from what I understand, you know, what, what you need, what we do is continuous innovation allows to continuously drive your value, which keeps you out of the commodity box and into the, you know, the, what we call the gray hair service box, which I'm sure you all want to be in the, the trusted advisor as opposed to a provider of commodity services. So I think it takes continuous innovation, always evaluating what your clients find of value to them and, uh, and just keep talking about it. You know, that's, that's my perspective. I, and there's, there's so much that happens within the course of a year, you know, financial advisor used to talk to me once a year and there'd be so much that has changed in that year um, that I'd be like, I need to talk to you more, you know, talk to me more. And then don't let all this pressure build up in my mind about where's the transparency, what's going on, what value are you bringing? Um, bring that to me more often. And then I won't come in with, a, with already some preconceived notions about how I'm not getting the most out of this relationship. You know, that's my advice. Anyway. No, that's awesome. Again, that's conversation number five fees in the client journey. And a great opportunity to not only find out what's out there, but you know, how do they want to engage with you? How do they want to engage with their wealth and, how, and what ideas do they have? So these are conversations that uh, really kind of, you know, really need to be, be had with your high net worth clients. So um, here's some connections, right? What, what are some shifts? What are some things we can do right now based on what you've kind of already learned and heard from Brett and I, right? Meet with any of your clients right now, right? And I think hopefully what you've, what you've heard is a couple ideas to have some conversation starters to prime a good conversation, a connection, particularly with prospects or clients, and offer growth ideas for them, for not just for their business, but for them personally, as Brent had mentioned. Um, anything around cybersecurity or cyber attacks, maybe push for a vulnerability assessment or some type of assessment. Do you have a connection? Because on, on a smaller scale, right, cyber insurance is really, I hate to spend anyone's money, but really uh, inexpensive relative to other business costs. And it's really a conversation to have. And I think internally with your marketing people and in IT, really kind of map that digital client journey to see where people go and when they want to tap out and talk to someone versus, hey, do I want to go deeper digitally into the vortex? And then think about how you can wow them. And I think you want to let, you know, let clients know what you're doing for them when you're not in touch. Kind of that rolling snowball of value when you're not there. and Let them know you're thinking of them and working on things when you're not around so they don't even have to have that fee. Or that, or that value conversation. So what I'd love to do right now, I've got 131 Eastern time. We're slated to go to 145. If anyone could find their chat room, um, I'd love to have, if you have any questions, uh, I'd love to have you kind of send them to me uh, and, um, and I can uh, leverage our time with Brent to answer any questions you might have uh, before we close today. I'm also in the process of, of unmuting you. So if we wanted to have any questions for Brent or I, you can go ahead and do that or the chat, however you'd like it. We have a few minutes.
Hey, Brett, why don't I do this while folks are either shaping up their questions or, or looking to, to, uh, to send some via chat. What are, what are some of the questions that you have? If you had to think about you now kind of hearing about some of the work that we do, the folks online, if both private client advisors and wealth management, certainly in the insurance space, what questions do you have of our community? What, what insights as a high net worth individual, certainly as a small business owner, would you want more or less of now in, in this era as we kind of work ourselves through, gosh, moving into the third quarter and, and towards the end of our, our year. Yeah, I'd want to, I'd appreciate seeing, um, you know, hearing trends, obviously what's going on. That, that's what I value. I, our, our insurance um, advisor just kind of recently spoke to us and said, well, you know, give us the, the highlights of the trends of what's happening on the industry, what they're seeing. I value that. I, I, like, to, I like to have folks come in and talk about what, what they see in my industry. You know what are they seeing in either the farm industry or professional services because then it gives me some something useful to kind of uh, talk about you know no that's great so um why don't i share this now as we get ready to close today just a little bit about what we're doing to facilitate some of these conversations you know those of you who had a chance to work with us we're really all about a client type approach to developing relationships, not only with your centers of influence, but actually meeting with prospects and clients. And as, as you, you might have thought, you know, we've converted so much of our curriculum to a, a virtual uh, delivery process. This is just one element of that. Some of our tried and true programs now are available virtu virtually, the 90 day dash and four steps to new business. Now we ran a, ran a great session just the other day. That was fabulous. And the new era of prospecting and wealth management uh, is not only a training class, but also a white paper. So please, you know, feel free to check us out on the web. There's free resources and something for everyone. And if you go to Bill Walton sales training .com forward slash blog, we are posting two to three times a day. There's video, there's downloads, and we're trying to not only provide our wisdom, but also those from others and, and leverage sessions like today to provide you that wisdom for you to be successful. So why don't I just do it, uh, say, uh, I'm gonna let Brent kind of close it out for us, but I wanted to thank you all for coming and, and, and joining us, certainly given where we are right now at the end of the week. And Brent, I can't thank you enough. I, I just know that the insights you gave today, I, I, can, I can tell people were scribbling and they've got their notes. So thanks for that. Any final thoughts, Brent, as we kind of send folks on their way today? Well, I just appreciate the opportunity to, to chat with you. It's a little out of my normal uh, daily routine. So this was a nice, uh, nice change of pace to, to have a different kind of topic. And I hope some of my insights were of value to some of you. And thanks, thanks, Bill, for the opportunity. Oh, they were great. And thanks, everybody. Just so you know, we've recorded this session, so everyone will get a copy of this. Again, please visit us at BillWaltonSalesTraining.com or find us up at LinkedIn at LinkedIn.com forward slash in forward slash Bill Walton Sales Training. So I'm Bill Walton for Brent Hirschbiegel. Thank you so much for joining COVID-19 and the High Net Worth Individual, five conversations to have as a private client advisor. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Thank you, guys.